Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about our work on guaranteed training of neural networks using tensor methods. This is a joint work with Majid Janzamin, who's now a tweeter, and Animan and Kumar. So neural networks have tremendous practical impact with deep learning in various domains, such as speech recognition, image understanding, video understanding, um, language understanding, language comprehension, personal assistance, and so on. But if you look at the optimization itself, it's a highly non-convex optimization problem. In practice, people use backprop or stochastic gradient descent, which is the first order method, and it can get a stock in bad local optima. There's been tremendous work and research in convex optimization, but as an example that I mentioned, training neural networks, a lot of problems are non-convex, so we are just at the, heat of the, at the peak of the iceberg, and we really want to dive in more. So a convex optimization has this very nice loss surface, and you have one global optima, whereas for non-convex optimization, you have multiple local optima, and as your dimension grows, you can have exponential number of local optima. So the question people are interested in is, how do you deal with non-convexity? Before I get to how we deal with this non-convexity, let me tell you more about this issue of local optima. Is it actually serious? Here is a toy example. I have a binary classification problem. The pink dots are labeled as class minus one, and the yellow dots are labeled as class one. So as you can see, if I find those green lines, I'm essentially done, and I can do a clean classification. And this can be done with a very simple neural network. So let's say X is my input, and I pass it through a two uh, a, a, a neural network with one layer, and which has just two neurons, which you can see uh, up there, and then it goes through label. So this one should actually be able to recover the, this solution pretty easily. But if you actually form the loss surface for this problem, you can see that there is a wide space of local optima that actually is uh, corresponding to these red dotted lines that you see. So you see if you get a stock in this local optima, you're essentially doing completely wrong classification. Another example which um, recently came out of DeepMind is let's consider the MNIST data set. MNIST data set is the data set of written digits, and the goal is to classify when you see a figure which digit it is. And this is a pretty um, well-studied problem. Now, if I want to train a feed-forward neural network with relu activation function, for example, which is widely used too, they look at different, uh, different uh, examples of uh, doing initialization. So when you s what you see on the left is if you do good initialization, you're essentially com doing this classification completely accurate. Whereas when you s what you see on the, on the other side is that if you're doing a wrong initialization or essentially a bad initialization, you could completely ruin your classification accuracy. And they did this for a two-layer model and a five-layer model too. So you can see that the local optima, when you start from bad initialization, what they mean is that essentially you get stuck in a bad local optima, and you can see it can completely ruin your performance. They did extensive experiments, and they show that if you start with a bad initialization, if you get stuck in bad local optima, it doesn't matter how many more iterations you do. You can't just get out of it. And also, it doesn't matter even if you make your network deeper. And also, it doesn't matter what uh, activation function you use. One might say, okay, let's do sigmoid. And they did experiments with sigmoid, and this, is, this essentially has the same problem. You can get a stuck in bad local optima, and this can lead to bad accuracy. So I hope I have motivated you about this problem of local optima being a serious problem. And I'm, next, I'm going to talk about our method on guaranteed training of neural networks. What we mean by guaranteed training means that we haven't designed an algorithm that is guaranteed to give, give you the global optima, the best possible solution. Let's dive into details of the algorithm itself. To make it um, more accessible, I've, I'm going to talk about three main elements, three main components we have in our algorithm. And the first one is matrix and tensor factorization. 
what we do is that we replace the objective, the usual objective function of neural network with that of a best tensor decomposition. What it means is that you have a tensor and you want to come up with a low rank tensor that approximates this as best as possible. I'll get into the meaning of low rank tensor if that's um, not uh, clear now, but what is, what is good about this? What is good about this is that by this transformation, you're still preserving the global optimal. So this is still giving you the same, this is still the same problem, but what has happened is that our group showed in the past that you can find the global optimal for tensor decomposition. So you're still in the domain of non-convex optimization, but for this specific non-convex optimization problem, we know how to do this. We know how to recover the global optimal with very mild and natural assumptions. And to make sure we are all on, the, all on the same page of what a tensor means, a tensor is nothing but a higher order matrix. So for example, if what we mean by a rank one tensor is that you, ha you have outer product of three different vectors. Now, what, it, what does a rank mean is that if you have a tensor and you decompose it into some of such ex uh, out, um, external, um, um, sorry, outer products, essentially the rank is the number of those three outer products. And the decom there are different type of kinds of way to decompose the tensor, but the one that they are interested in is called CP decomposition, and this is essentially trying to find this rank one component. So for example, I have this tensor T here, and this is decomposed into some of two rank one components, and a rank one component is just outer product of these three different vectors that you see. There are different algorithms to uh, do this um, tensor decomposition efficiently. One of them is alternative least square and the other one is tensor power iteration. Tensor power iteration is essentially the same as matrix power iteration and you just do updates uh, sequentially and it's easily parallelizable. So I talked about the first important element. Okay, if you find this tensor that has this information and we know that this is relating to the neural network, we are done. But what is the tensor? And that's where method of moments comes in. So we are in supervised setting, right? We have input and we have corresponding label to it. And we know that the input has passed some nonlinear transformation through this activation function of the neural network. We have a random input and we have a random label and there are different possible moments to make, right? A moment is nothing but looking at um, uh, some of, ex um, some of uh, outer products between label and label, or label and input, or input and itself. There are different possibilities for different models, but the question that is important here to ask is that what moment is actually useful for me? Let's assume that we have a neural network that the activation function is linear. So if you look at the input, it passed through So if you look at the label, you can actually see this weight matrix for the first layer, which is for the one here, and then you're done, right? But the trouble here is that there is no such thing. We don't have a linear transformation. We don't have a linear uh, activation function. We have a nonlinear one. So if you look at the label, you don't really see anything because the, this weight matrix for the first layer is essentially gone through a nonlinear transformation. The idea we propose is that we want to do some linearization such that this weight matrix actually comes out. So, and what I mean by linearization is that essentially we are looking at, in the label, we are looking at, at this nonlinear uh, function of A1 times X. So if I take the derivative by chain rule, which is simple, A1 comes out. That's what I mean by linearization. So then the question that we are interested in that is what is a fun, uh, so we form this cross moment between label and some function of the input. If that function of the input is such that this gives us the derivative information, we are essentially done. Because by training a neural network, essentially we are looking at these weight matrices. And this takes us 
to um, to actually let me um, talk about what happens if I have this linear uh, this derivative operator. Let's assume that the label is generated by passing the input through a single layer neural network. So we have a neural network that in, in this uh, picture it has two neurons. So the input goes through the weight matrix for the first layer, passes the nonlinearity, goes through the second weight matrix and gets to the label. And this is the mathematical form. And we can see that the columns of the weight matrix for the first layer, each column is related to the weights corresponding to each of the neurons. So having my derivative operator helps why? Let's assume I have this magical function that the uh, M's, or, uh, M's function gives me the M's order derivative operator. Now if I form the moment between label and this first order derivative, essentially what happens is that if we look at the mathematical form and we do the chain rule in our head, what happens is that it's some matrix times A1. And essentially, it's just summing up the columns of A1 and giving it to me as an output. So of course, if we sum them up together, everything shrinks down, so we can't really recover this. But if I take the second order derivative, and again, if we do the math, what happens is that I have a matrix that if I decompose it, meaning that if I find its underlying components, this is essentially the columns of my weight matrix. And if I take the third order derivative, now I have a tensor that if I decompose this, I have, the weight uh, I have the columns of the weight matrix and I'm done. What we say is that we should do tensor, not matrices. And this is uh, from a well-known fact that if you do matrix decomposition, essentially it can only recover the subspace for you. It doesn't recover the actual columns. As opposed to tensor decomposition that under some mild assumption can give you uniquely what are the columns of the weight matrix. So now that I've, said, uh, I've showed that if I found that derivative operator, I'm essentially done, the next question is, what is this magical function of the input that can essentially give me that derivative operator? And this leads us to the third element, third important component of our method, which is probabilistic models. So let's say I have a continuous input x with some probability distribution function p of x. It's now in a statistics that a score function is defined as derivative of logarithmic of the PDF, and it has some nice um, characteristics. So if I have a vector input, essentially this score function is uh, also vector. What we did was that we have extended this to a higher order, to definition of higher order score function. And we define m's order score function as normalized m's order derivative of the PDF. So going back to our vector input, then the second score function would be a matrix, the third score function would be a third order moment, and so on. But what is interesting about the score function? We have shown that this score function is actually that magical function that we are looking at. So this gives you the derivative information. Let's assume I have a label function f of x, meaning that expected value of label given the input is shown by f of, uh, is derived by f of x. So if I now form the cross moment between label and m's order score function, this essentially gives me the m's order derivative of the function. Thinking back about our neural network, I showed that if I form the cross moment between label and third order score function, it gives me a tensor, and that tensor, if it's decomposed, it gives me the weight matrix for the first layer. So with that, I've told you about all the main components, which is matrix and tensor factorization, method of moments, and probabilistic models. So I can now tell you the complete picture. This is, uh, our algorithm is called NNLIFT, which is abbreviation for neural network learning using feature tensors. So you have a vector input, you use probabilistic models to come up with the score function of it and the third order score function of it. Then you form the cross moment between label and this third order score function. And by cross moment, I mean essentially for each input, you have this score function tensor, you multiply it by the label, and you sum up over all the input values you have. Once you have that, you do tensor decomposition, and as I showed, this gives you rank one components of the weight matrix for the first layer, which 
to said simply, it gives you the columns of the weight matrix for the first layer. And this is the most important thing to find because the rest is easy. You can use a Fourier technique to find the bias of the first layer and after that it's just regression. You can find the weight, uh, weight and bias for the second layer and essentially you're done. So now that we uh, we've covered the algorithm, let me actually tell you about the error analysis. Assuming we have that two layer neural networks that I showed you, and assuming that we are in realizable setting, meaning that the input actually passed through a neural network to get to the label, if we assume that the weight matrix for the first layer is full column rank, meaning that there is no uh, additional uh, neurons that is just a linear combination of the other ones, with polynomial samples, we can actually get an error such that the squared error is bounded by one over number of samples. And my number of sample is a polynomial of D, which is dimension of your input, and K, which is number of your neurons. But we didn't stop here. You see that we have this realizable setting assumption. So what we do is that how do we generalize this? What if we have a function that is deriving the label from the input, but is not a neural network? Because in practice, what we do is that we are using a neural network to approximate whatever label function there is, and then we are estimating their base. So in this case, we have two errors that we need to look at. One is fit, uh, how do you, uh, the approximation error in fitting the fu label function through a neural network, and the second one is that now that I have the neural network, how do I estimate the weight matrix? So I talked about the second one. Let's now focus on the approximation error. One thing I need to mention is that it's widely known that if you have a continuous function with a compact domain, you can arbitrarily well approximate it using just a single layer neural network. So the approximation error, the idea we use comes from Barron, which uh, relates the approximation error to Fourier spectrum of your label function. So what he says is that if you have a label function f of x, if you take the Fourier transform and then you look at this constant, which is nothing but first absolute moment of the Fourier distribution, and he calls it C sub f, your approximation error is bounded by this C sub f over root number of the neurons you have. So if you have, a, if you're approximating a function that has this nice Fourier spectrum property, your approximation error is bounded by this. I'm not getting into details of uh, Baron, Baron's proof, but essentially his idea is that if you take the Fourier transform and you look at absolute value of the uh, frequency times absolute value of the Fourier spectrum, and if you just take random draws of it, these random draws are directly corresponding to these weight uh, columns in your first layer. Now that we've captured both errors, let's put everything together this is the main result for NNLEAF algorithm. If you're approximating an arbitrarily function f of x with some bounded c sub f, and if you assume that this c sub f is a small, your error is bounded by these two terms. One over number of your samples and plus c sub f squared over number of neurons you have. What I need to mention, that which is important here, is that we have polynomial sample complexity, which is actually a very low order polynomial in terms of the dimension of the input and number of neurons. And the tensor methods are very easily parallelizable. And if you run N and lift in parallel, it, the computational complexity would be the same as a stochastic gradient descent. I'm just gonna give it a little bit of sneak peek into how does this work in practice. We did experiment and then leaf versus back prop. And the data set we used is MNIS, which as I said, it's the, the handwritten digits. And we use the nosing autoencoder to estimate our score function, right? So you need something to estimate your score function for you. And Allen and Bengio showed in 2014 that if you use a denoising autoencoder, it gives you the score function, which is a general meaning, but in our case, it's just a first order score function. In our paper, we showed that if you have the first order score function, you can learn the rest recursively. So once we use any method to estimate the score function and denoising encoder is just one of them, you essentially have everything. 
And just a quick recap, a denoising autoencoder is a simple model that if you have a noisy input, you're trying to recover the input uh, with, uh, with um, a shallow neural network. So now let's get to the results. What we see is that for MNIST data set and just using denoising autoencoder, which is the simplest one to, et, um, to approximate the score function, we outperform backpropagation with SGD, even, in our, even if our hidden dimension is small. Just to give you an example, we are 10% better if you have 128 neurons. One might say is that, but people don't use plain SGD in practice. A lot of times people use Adam. We did try that too. Even if you try Adam for your back prop, still you cannot beat NN lift on this data set. Another thing that we tried is that people talk a lot about deep learning needs a lot of data. And what we tried is that, okay, let's subsample MNIST and see how well these two methods do. And what we saw is that even if we use Adam, if we downsample the labeled data, NLIST outperforms Adam by six to 12% based on how, uh, how much you're subsampling and downsampling. And more experiments are coming up in recent, in upcoming days, but this is what uh, I wanted to show you right now. So now that I've covered NLIST, I wanna mention a couple of more important, a couple of other important things. And one is that NLIF is just part of a general framework that we have designed to tr learn discriminative models. And it has three main elements, as I said, probabilistic models, method of moments, and matrix and tensor factorization. The other uh, discriminative models that we look into was mixture of generalized linear model. What is a mixture of generalized linear model? Essentially, uh, you have different directions, and for each input, you choose one of the directions you multiply it with your input and then you pass it through a nonlinearity. And what we showed was that for the first time we can actually recover these directions themselves, not just the subspace. The other interesting example that we have looked at is mixture of linear regression. Mixture of linear regression is essentially you have some hidden choosing factor, but for each input you find one of these linear regressions and you pass it through that. And the interesting part about linear regression, mixture of linear regression is that you don't need to have the higher order derivatives in your model, still you could recover. And the, the trick we do here is that instead of looking at cross moment between label and input, we look at label to the tree times uh, the score function of the input. So we get rid of that problem of vanishing uh, derivative. Most recently, uh, we've uh, actually extended it to guarantee training of recurrent neural networks. So, uh, so the first um, figure you see is just a feed-forward neural network. You have an input, you pass it through a neural network, you have the output, and it doesn't. Uh, and inputs are actually independent. And when you make the label, you only look at the input at that time. Whereas in case of recurrent neural network, what happens is that the Im some information of your input is encoded into hidden layer, and it's passed on through some weight matrix through the hidden layer in the next step, and so on. And, people, and afterwards, people actually looked into bidirectional recurring neural networks, meaning that at each step, you're getting feedback from hidden states from the future and the past. And, for, and one very um, successful example is in case of text. When you're looking at text, it's really important what words, come, what words comes before, but also what words come afterwards. The mathematical form for recurring neural networks is essentially this. So the difference here is that you have now this second weight matrix that corresponds, in, that links the hidden layer from the last step to the one that is here. And for bidirectional one, essentially you have, for the label you get feedback from two kinds of hidden neurons, one that gets feedback from earlier ones, and one that gets feedback from the uh, future um, hidden, uh, hidden nodes or neurons. So as you can see, this is a more difficult problem because what we showed was that we formed a cross moment between label and um, the score function of the input. If you want to f learn that U uh, matrix, you can't really have access to the neurons, right? You can't find their score function, you can't form their cross moment, so what do you do? Of course, you can learn the weight matrix A1, given uh, what I showed you already, but 
you cannot find that gene. The other trouble is that you have an input sequence. They're not IID, and um, you need to ensure that all these feedbacks stays bounded. So what we did was that we have extended um, fees to take care of both recurrent neural networks and bidirectional recurrent neural networks. The idea is to first assume some Markovian evolution for the input sequence and also extend the score function to the notion of Markov chains and also the case that the, inpu the input itself is a sequence that things are related. And uh, what I mentioned about learning the weight matrix between hidden uh, neurons, what we come up with is that if you look at the hidden neuron at each step, it's actually a function of all the sequences of the input. So it's like a function instead of a inside a function inside a function. So if we keep taking derivatives and if we have a polynomial activation function, we can essentially recover those as well. Uh, I'm not getting into the details. You could um, look at the paper itself or come talk to me offline. And here is the list of the papers that I covered in my talk today. Um, the first one covers NLEAF. The second one talks about uh, the general framework which we call FIST. And uh, the third one is actually where we started looking into neural networks, so that's the matrix case. And also the, afterwards, the, the one that is about learning mixture of GLMs, and the last one is the one that I just covered about learning recurrent neural networks and bidirectional recurrent neural networks. In summary, I talked about our method that for the first time has guaranteed risk bound for neural networks. It has efficient sample complexity, it has efficient computational complexity, and the core idea, the core takeaway is that you come up with these new features that come from these score functions. And as I said, it's useful in general for learning different discriminative models and come up with different features, and I, I mentioned briefly that we have extended it to recurrent neural networks and bidirectional recurrent neural networks. What I'm excited about moving forward is that how do we extend it to convolutional neural networks because those also have gained a lot of uh, success recently in deep learning and look into more uh, pre-call performance. And also another interesting thing that we've seen in deep learning and didn't exist here is that we have all these regularizations. How do we analyze this theoretically? How do we bring them in here in practice? So from theoretical perspective, what happens is that, and that's something that we are actually currently working on, is that you could learn the first layer, encode it in, essentially the output of the first layer becomes your input to the second layer, and keep going on. Of course, from theoretical perspective, you need to take care of all these error propagation, and you need to bound these errors so that you could still recover. And from empirical analysis, that's actually the next thing that we are going to implement and look into. So this is something that hasn't been proved, and the assumption in that paper, the assumptions are not really real world assumptions. What we see in practice with deep learning is that people try different initializations and try to come up with initializations that work well, and at the end, whenever they run out of money, they, do an, they look at the best case scenario and say this is the result that they have. So what this work proposes is that maybe there are some places that we haven't got to. And a lot of people in deep learning agree that we are in local optima, but it may be the best, this is the best we can do with current methods, but this can open horizons to get even better. 